So in the last message, we talked about the mark of the beast, that in conjunction with the worship of the Antichrist, all would be made to take the mark of his name or the number of his name, either on their right hand or their forehead. And we talked about the implications of this. And actually, we're going to go back and revisit that as well. Because last time we talked about uh, Deuteronomy 6.4 and following, and we talked about the fact that uh, in God's Word it says those are the places that were reserved that God want us uh, to have His Word focused in those areas. And those areas, uh, many things represent the thought and the action, right? Our head and our hand. And so we talked about that a little bit. And we also talked about the fact that all who refuse to worship the Antichrist would be killed. And uh, this is something that the first century believers that were alive uh, when Revelation was first written would have been very, very familiar with because emperor worship was required in the Roman Empire and the penalty for refusing to comply was death. And many, many Christians did. And so today we're going to move on, and we're going to see a connection here between uh, chapter 14 and chapter 13, and we're going to see many, many contrasts that we're going to talk about here today. So for the purpose of our message today, I'm only going to read the first eight verses of uh, chapter 14, or actually the first seven verses. So looking at Revelation chapter 14... Verses 1 through 7, the Word of God says, Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. They are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth, and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and see in the springs of waters. And with that, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, how thankful I am for the gift of your word, particularly this book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. We ask your spirit, Father, the same spirit that inspired these words, to be with us today as we look into your word, that the same spirit that inspired these words would open our hearts and our minds to hear them. We ask all of this in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So here in the opening of chapter 14, we find the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, standing with the 144,000. And I say the 144,000 because I can find no reason at all not to think that this is the same 144,000 that we discussed back in chapter 7. So if you would, I'm going to have you turn back a little bit to Revelation chapter 7. And I'm going to read verses uh, 1 through 8. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, 
having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed, from every tribe of the sons of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. <clears throat> so these that we just read of here are those who were sealed with the mark of God. So they belonged to God and were sealed and protected. And you may recall that chapter 7 came right under all of, right after rather all of the harsh judgments that we read about in chapter 6. And so we saw that these this particular group were sealed and protected by God before the coming of these judgments. Uh, they were marked out for special service to God. And there is as I said then much debate about who these uh, 144,000 actually represent. Uh, it is a debated thing. Many simply see them as a representation of the church. Uh, I tend to read this text a little bit more literally uh, because of the fact it distinctly says that they are of the people of Israel. And it also gives us over and over again, as I just read, in fact, I read that for effect. 12,000, 12,000, 12,000, again and again. So I tend to take the number and the description very literally in that text. And in fact, if we look contextually what surrounds the discussion of the 144,000, I also tentatively hold to the view that not only are these 144,000 set aside for special service, but they are actually evangelists during the tribulation period and are largely responsible for the multitudes that we read about in uh, later on in chapter 7 and uh, later on in Revelation as well for the multitudes that come through this horrendous period known as the tribulation and the great tribulation uh, period. And so that is how I again tentatively uh, understand this group of 144,000. So this idea of marking, as I said, is that of protection. Uh, it is a distinction. And it's very similar here to the idea of the Passover. Those who, are, who painted their doorposts with lamb's blood were passed over, and God's judgment uh, passed them by. And this is the same idea that we see here with the 144,000, that they were specially marked for protection. Uh, perhaps one of the closest parallels to be found is in Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 3 and following. We read there, Then the glory of the God of Israel ascended from the cherub on which it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed in linen, at whose waist was the scribe's kit. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, throughout the midst of Jerusalem, and make a mark on the foreheads of the people who groan and sigh over all the abominations which are being committed in its midst. But to the others he said in my presence, Go through the city after him and strike. Do not let your eye have pity and do not spare. So we read here that they were to wipe out all of those who did not bear the mark. And the significance there in Israel, of course, is these were the people who were lamenting and heartbroken over all the sin that they saw being committed in the city. And uh, we're told there that that is the distinction that is made in the group. So the number 144,000 certainly uh, appears to be a significant number. Uh, 12 times 12 is about one of the most perfect squares, I think, that we could ever think of. 
uh, and it's uh, also similar to how we find New Jerusalem described when we get to the end of Revelation. Uh, the New Jerusalem is described as being a perfect cube. Its length, width, and, and height and everything is all uh, the same. It's all equal. So the tribes that we find here listed, uh, and I, again, I think all of these references, when we dig into them a little bit, are significant. The only tribe not mentioned here is the tribe of Dan, which long was long associated through the Old Testament with idolatry. And uh, here, Dan is nowhere to be found. Uh, history tells us that it appears that the tribe of Dan assimilated into the Phoenician people, causing them to essentially vanish, as it were. Uh, instead, here we see Joseph listed, as we would expect, but then his son Manasseh takes the place of the tribe of Dan. So that's the only real significant thing that I wanted to point out once again about the list. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, I uh, again, as I explained last week, there are certain parts of this book I am not ashamed to tell you. Uh, there is much debate on certain things, but I tend to see this group um, as specially set aside evangelists uh, that will be an outreach and a witness during the Revelation period. So if we go back to Revelation 14 at this point, we will see that the 144,000 are now standing on Mount Zion with the Lamb. <clears throat> so as I said, uh, here in chapters 13 and 14, we see a number of contrasts that are made between the people of God and those that worship the beast. Um, so here we see that they are standing on Mount Zion, and Mount Zion is another name for Jerusalem. Uh, there is some debate here uh, as to whether what is being pictured is earthly Jerusalem or the heavenly Jerusalem. And I'll be honest with you, I think as much as we may look at this, it's very hard to decide which way to go. But I also remind myself here, as I remind you, that what we are talking about here is a vision that John is having. So there's no reason at all why it couldn't be one or the other, because he's having a vision and then he's trying to communicate to us what the vision is. So it's not like somebody taking a video camera and necessarily videotaping something that is uh, currently taking place in the world. Uh, as I said, it is hard to decide which we are to go with here, whether we have in mind the earthly or the heavenly Jerusalem. But again, as I've said so many times, I think the take-home truth here, big picture stuff, is crystal clear. I think undoubtedly that we are supposed to have in mind here the second psalm. Other things as well, certainly, but the second psalm almost fits like a, uh, an overlay for this entire chapter of chapter 14. So Psalm 2 reads, Why are the nations restless and the people plotting in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers conspire together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their shackles apart and throw their ropes away from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will announce the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have fathered you. Ask it of me, and I will certainly give the nations as your inheritance, and the ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and you shall shatter them like earthenware. Now then, you kings, use insight. Let yourselves be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverence, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, that he be not angry, and you perish on the way. For his wrath may be kindled quickly. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. And certainly, uh, as I read that again this morning, I was thinking, you know, that could serve not only as an overlay for 14, but as the entire book uh, as a whole. So, again, I just it struck me that perhaps we are supposed to have Psalm 2 in mind as we 
uh, go through the rest of this chapter. So just as we discussed last week uh, concerning the mark of the beast, these 144,000 have the name of Jesus and of the Father on their foreheads. So all is as it should be. Uh, what is supposed to be there, what is to take the proper place in front and center, uh, is where it belongs. Uh, the name of the Lord uh, is upon their foreheads. Uh, in verse 2, as we have discussed during other visions from Revelation, these are descriptions used here for the voice of God. Uh, if you think back to the other heavenly visions that we've had in Revelation, the voice of God and the voice of the Lord Jesus has been presented as the sound of thunder and also as the sound of many waters. We also have added to it here the sound of harpists. So this kind of gives us the idea of organization to it, a, uh, a harmony or a musicality to it. Uh, it's not just loud noise. Uh, but apparently there is also uh, a beauty to it as well as I think we would expect. So the 144,000 are given a new song, a song that only they can sing. And so once again, I think that we have pictured here a distinct group for a particular purpose uh, in a particular time. And they sing before the throne and the four creatures and the 24 elders. Again, these are elements that we have discussed before from other heavenly visions in Revelation. We have the four uh, cherubim, the four angels that are always in the presence of God. And then we also have the 24 elders, which as we talked about back along, represent the church. Okay. Again, 24, it's... Uh, a division of 12, so again, perhaps we see 12 being the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles represented perhaps in the 24. But again, the numbers are almost certainly significant. So these 144,000 have been purchased from the earth. They have been bought, redeemed, and undoubtedly what is in mind here is they have been redeemed through the precious blood of Christ as we read in First Peter. Also in focus here is the level of sanctification and the level of purity of this group. They are undefiled. They have kept themselves pure. Now, there's nothing defiling about God-sanctioned marriage and marital activity within a marriage. The New Testament makes that crystal clear. Nor is marriage looked down upon uh, quite the opposite, in fact, especially if we go to Ephesians 5 and we read about uh, what the Apostle Paul has to say about marriage there. Marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. Uh, but the idea here, rather, is the purity that this group represents. Uh, they are completely sanctified and set apart for service to God. And what, what is covered in the New Testament in terms of marriage is the Apostle Paul makes the point that if one is married, then undoubtedly some of their focus and their energy is put upon pleasing their wife or their husband. And for those that are set apart for special service who go unmarried, they can wholly devote themselves to the things of God. And this is an idea that goes back, obviously, a very long time to the writing of the New Testament. This idea that... Um, you know, perhaps these people are even more available in a sense uh, as far as completely devoting themselves to the work of God. <clears throat> they are set apart uh, to a high degree, and this, of course, is being directly contrasted to what we talked about in the last chapter, which was those who took the mark of the beast, uh, those who dwell on the earth, representing unbelievers, who instead of... Uh, trusting in God and staying true to God, instead succumb to taking the mark of the beast um, and being condemned. Um, again, one of the other things that I think that we're supposed to uh, take out of this in terms of that high level of purity is the example here is used that there is no deceit amongst these people. Uh, they speak the truth, no lie is found upon their mouth. And again, we have this picture of uh, very, very strong sanctification and being set apart 
uh, to God. And we also see here their reward. Uh, this group was probably eventually martyred, I would think, as they ministered during the time of the beast. Uh, yes, they were set apart for God and protected for a particular service, but as we talked about when we originally talked about the 144,000, um, as uh, some theologians have pointed out, essentially everybody is immortal until God uh, has fulfilled his purposes in them. Uh, and perhaps eventually this group also was martyred. But we see them now in the presence of Christ on Mount Zion, and we see that they will forever be following the Lamb wherever He may go. And so also in picture here is the reward. As we will read later on in chapter 14, those who take the mark of the beast have nothing coming to them except judgment. But this group that stayed true to God uh, is going to receive their heavenly reward. Looking at verses 6 and 7. <clears throat> Make sure I'm in the right place here. And I saw another angel flying in mid heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth, and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God. And give him glory, because the hour of his, of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of waters. So here we find an angel flying, preaching an eternal gospel, we are told, uh, that he is to preach to those who live on the earth. And once again, as we've said many, many times, those who live on the earth or those who dwell on the earth and revelation is used as a technical term to refer to unbelievers. And so we automatically know that that is the case. Uh, that this is preached to every tribe, nation, tongue, and people tells us it is to everyone. The gospel is to be preached to everyone, and we are to preach the gospel to every creature, as Scripture tells us. With this is the warning of the coming judgment. Christ himself says in the Olivet Discourse that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And I think that's exactly what we find pictured right here, is the idea that uh, there won't be anybody at that time with an excuse, because not only has evangelism taken place and gone through all the earth, but here we find an angel flying through mid-heaven proclaiming this eternal gospel. Now I have to tell you once again, and this is not going to come as a major shocker to you, there is much debate in the academic world as to which gospel this might be in reference to. And I was a little bit puzzled at first. I kind of stared at the text and then I scratched my head a little bit. And then the more I thought about it, the more I said, well, wait a second, there's only one gospel. Scripture makes that very, very plain. There's only one gospel, and this is an eternal gospel, so it must be the gospel. And I have no reason to expect or to interpret this any other way. Uh, this angel is simply proclaiming the good news about Jesus Christ. Uh, if it's not the whole unadulterated biblical gospel, then it's not the gospel. There's only one. And if you were here last week, then you'll know what I mean that I can say, if it's not the real gospel, then it's not the real McCoy. And uh, this is much more serious than what lubricates your lo locomotive. Just as the text tells us, this is an eternal gospel with eternal consequences. And this is the severe warning that we find in Scripture given by the Apostle Paul, writing by the Spirit to the church in Galatia. And to give you a little bit of background on that book, Paul is writing the Galatians because they have started to be swayed away from the true gospel, and others are trying to get them to add works into their, into their gospel. And you can almost feel the urgency in the opening of this letter to the Galatians because Paul skips over his 
a lot of his normal niceties when he opens the letter, and he gets right to the point, which illustrates to us the importance uh, that they get this right. So in Galatians chapter 1, picking up in verse 6, we read, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Now I want to explain to you here just how serious the Apostle Paul is being. Uh, the word that is translated accursed here is the word anathema. Okay? So this word anathema in the Greek uh, speaks of something that is set aside for God, but for the purpose of total destruction. Uh, to put it blunt, bluntly, and I am going to put it this bluntly, the Apostle Paul is saying, if anybody teaches to you another gospel, let him be damned. That's what he's saying. That's the seriousness that he is taking this. Because when we teach a false gospel, if we are guilty of doing so, again, it is of eternal consequence. We would be guilty of leading people astray and having their blood on our souls. Uh, something that is uh, not only deathly serious, but eternally serious. So I want to take the time here to talk about what is the gospel. Uh, it's actually rather shocking that they've done research and surveys and things, and even amongst church pastors throughout the country, if they ask people what the gospel is, it's astonishing how often they get various answers. Uh, and it is very important that we understand exactly what the gospel is and what it entails. So let me start by saying it's actually quite simple. We can actually explain the gospel to children. Children can understand the gospel. They can place their trust in Christ and be saved. Uh, the gospel is also so complex that we can spend an entire lifetime studying it and never exhaust it of its beauty, of its depth, and so on and so forth. So what I'm going to try to do here today is kind of shoot somewhere down the middle. I want to make sure that I give you all of the vital elements of the gospel, hopefully with some detail, but hopefully also uh, in a fairly brief fashion, because obviously uh, I could go on and on, and sometimes do. <laughs> so the biblical gospel here, what does Scripture tell us that it is. And I have to tell you, I saw, I rode by a church recently, and I can't even remember where it is, so if you know, please let me know. But I rode by a church, and right on, right on the front of the church it says, Full Gospel Church. And I thought, now that's pretty great. They're telling you right up front, hey, you come here, you're going to get the full gospel. And I hope that's true. Uh, I really do. And I, I, I trust that it is, but I really hope that's the case. So, to know the gospel and to have all of the information, we have to have certain things that are made clear. We have to know something about God. We have to know something about our predicament before God. We have to know about Jesus. And then we have to understand that how we respond to that information is what joins us to Christ and actually gets us saved. Okay? So I'm going to, again, shoot through this uh, hopefully in some detail. So, in Genesis 1.1, we read, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So, Genesis goes on to tell us that God made all things. He is the creator of the entire universe. He created all life, and He created us as well. Okay? And it has been said that this is no small point when it comes to the gospel. Now, we don't always see this information presented in Scripture, because especially when the gospel was given to Jews, they knew all this. They knew, they knew the situation with God. They understood he was creator and so on and so forth. Well, in today's world, we can't take that for granted at all. There's all kinds of different worldviews out there, and people may not understand that God is creator. So this may be a very important piece for us to share with people. 
Uh, in fact, Francis Schaeffer once said if he had 60 minutes to talk to somebody on an airplane about the gospel, he would spend the first 55 minutes talking about God and about his role as creator, and then he would save the last five minutes to give them the gospel. And this illustrates the importance. People have to know who God is and what their situation is before him before this actually becomes good news. Because otherwise, we've just offered people to a solution, that, uh, a solution to a problem that they consider to be a non-issue, right? Uh, we can only value Jesus as our Savior if we recognize we need a Savior, and we need it more than we need anything in this life and the life beyond. So not only does God have the authority to hold us accountable as the Creator who made all things, but he also has the power to hold us accountable. Scripture tells us that God is infinite. He is eternal, omniscient. That means that he knows uh, all things, and he is omnipresent. He is everywhere. You can't run from him. You can't hide from him. You can't keep secrets from him. He knows everything. And so this is the God with whom we must deal, as Scripture says. God is also immutable, he does not change, and he is absolutely perfect in every way. And this perfection actually is part of what uh, gets us in trouble, because we are not perfect. And what is God like? He is loving, he is merciful, but he is also holy. He is absolutely pure. Uh, he is holy and he is just. And he is perfectly just. He cannot and will not tolerate sin. Once again, he will not and cannot tolerate sin. We should also be aware that God exists as a triune God. It's a triunity. Three persons in one God. And no, it's not a logical contradiction because I'm not speaking of God as three and one in the same way, in the same relationship. So if we can picture what constitutes God, and we could somehow put that over here, we can say that that God exists eternally in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God existing eternally in three persons. And as I said, we also need to know some truth about us, about what is the problem that plagues mankind. God made us in his image. Uh, we share certain things in common with God. There are certain ways that we are actually similar to God. We are given intelligence. We have the ability to make choices, for example. And we're also created for relationship. We are created for relationship with him and for relationship with each other. It's just sometimes those relationships don't go quite the way things were originally planned. And the reason for that is something known as the fall. When God created man, he created Adam and Eve. He put them in a lush, beautiful, perfect garden where they had basically everything they could ever want. They had close fellowship with God, but he gave them one command. And the command was, you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And they were tempted. They partook of the fruit. And when they sinned against God, they plunged the entire world into sin. And ever since then, not only, you know, when we look out the window, we do not see a world that exists the way that God created it. So if you've ever wondered what's wrong with the world, there's your answer. Uh, when God created the world, there was no sin, there was no death. Uh, it must have been an incredible place. And it's a place that I look forward to living in once again. But because of this, uh, ever since Adam's sin, every human being that has been born ever since then, from Adam has inherited a sin nature. And that sin nature makes us sinners. It has been said, uh, we're not sinners because we sin, rather we sin because we are sinners and we have this nature in us. In fact, we love sin and we're quite addicted to it in our natural state. <clears throat> so 
So due to God's holiness and justice, the punishment for sin is death. Uh, Romans 6.23 actually tells us explicitly the wages of sin is death. So we get death the old-fashioned way. We earn it uh, through our sin and because of our sin nature. And so not only did Adam and Eve die physically, which wasn't part of the original plan, uh, but any who are unredeemed are uh, estranged from God and they will suffer eternal separation from God forever in a horrible, painful place called hell unless their predicament is dealt with. Now why is this? Why would a sinner deserve to suffer forever in a horrible place of punishment for offending God? And the reason is because God is a holy, infinite God. Uh, we can't even talk about God's infinite value because it's infinite. Uh, we have no way to put it into words or to truly understand it. Um, so we, therefore, would be in a position where we would be forever paying for our crimes against him. So, so far, if you're with me, this is not good news. Am I right? Uh, this is the bad news, but this is an essential part of the gospel because without understanding all of this, um, no one can really understand why accepting Christ as our Savior is so very vital. So how do we fix this? Where does the good news come in? Um, it comes in in the fact that Jesus does for us which we, that which we could never do for ourselves. God's standard is absolute perfection. Uh, I taught with somebody one time at a camp, and he used to say it only takes one pinhole to pop a balloon, right? If you take a balloon this big, the whole balloon can be perfect. You put one little pinhole in it, and it's done for. It's gone. Well, that's the way we are. Even if we, even if we think that we don't really sin that much or we haven't done anything, God's standard is absolute perfection. And because of the nature of who he is, that sin must be punished. So what can be done? Jesus. Jesus is the good news. God foreordained the coming of Jesus to rescue sinners before the foundation of the world, we read in 1 Peter 1.20. And we actually talked about that a few messages ago. So the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, was born to the Virgin Mary he is fully God and fully human in one person. He is God in human flesh. And because God is his Father, Jesus was born without a sin nature. And Jesus went on to live a completely perfect life under the law, and he never sinned one time. And therefore, he qualifies to be our Savior because he went to the cross and he took a death that he didn't deserve on our behalf so that God could in turn forgive us in Christ and set us free. And this blows me away every time I talk about it, but not only does he declare us righteous in Christ, that means that on the basis of Christ's perfect life, God slaps down his divine gavel and he declares the sinner righteous based on Jesus' perfect life. And then he turns around and he adopts us into his holy family. Uh, John 1.12 tells us that, that to those that received him, he gave them the right to become children of God. So beyond even just saving us, God then opens his arms and accepts us as his children into his family. So what's left? What's left is our response. This is not an automatic thing. Scripture makes this very, very clear. What we do with the information that you were just given is going to decide for each and every one of us where we will spend eternity. This is, as we just read, an eternal gospel. And our, the decision that we make here is one that is going to affect us for all of eternity, not just in the rest of our life here. Our response is vital. So what must we do to be saved? We must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. John 3, verses 16 through 18 reads, 
For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. It's just that simple, folks. We like to make it complicated. We like to think that we somehow have to become perfect people. Uh, that's not the gospel. The gospel is this is the free gift of God that is given to all. If we will simply take this information and we will put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, God will forgive us and he will adopt us as his children. We simply must repent. That means that we turn away from our sin. We agree with God, yes, I understand that I'm a sinner. You are right, I have offended you. I have not been living for you. I have been living in hostility to you. And we turn away from that life and we turn towards God. doesn't mean that any one of us is going to be perfect. Uh, Lord knows we won't. We're going to struggle. Uh, we will feel broken about our sin. We will struggle with that sin. And yet, we know that we are forgiven all in Christ if we continue to trust in Him. And I want to stress this point. We cannot earn it. Christianity stands alone as the only faith system that doesn't somehow demand that you do something to somehow appease a God or a deity or somehow bribe or earn your way into good standing with them. And I want you to think about something for a second. A good earthly judge wouldn't do that. They wouldn't. If I get caught doing 100 miles an hour down Kennebec Road and I have to appear before a judge, anything that comes out of my mouth in that courtroom is not going to help me one bit. You know, I can tell them about all the things that I've tried to do, how I've tried to be a good person, um, you know, how I've tried to help the community, you know, perhaps through being a fireman or a paramedic, so on and so forth. The judge is going to shake his head, he's going to slap that gavel down, and he's going to pronounce me guilty. Why would we ever think that we could do that with God and somehow bribe him somehow through the things that we manage to do well or correctly? Uh, that dog is not going to hunt. We have to have the ability to just despair of our own righteousness and throw it away. Uh, God sees it, uh, we are told in uh, Isaiah, as dirty rags. Uh, despair of anything that you're capable of doing and instead throw yourself on the mercy that is available in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, I am asking you, please, while today is still called today, recognize your sin before God and place your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It is that simple. For those of us who already know the Lord Jesus, uh, as we recount the gospel one more time, I have to tell you, I love what Alastair Begg says. Alastair Begg says that we must preach the gospel to ourselves over and over again all the time. And he's exactly right. Because if we don't, we can find ourselves looking all too closely on the things that we do, and it will lead us to despair, as he says, because we'll realize we just keep falling down. If we don't do that, then we will start to get prideful, and we'll say, hey, look how good I am. I'm a believer in Jesus, and I'm all that in a bag of chips. And we will get this horrible kind of arrogance. And we, we can't have either of those things. This is all the gift of God. It is all a work of God. And we bring absolutely nothing to the table. Empty hands we bring. It is simply to the cross that we cling, and we must continue to cling. And with that, I would like to close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this good news. Uh, there's a lot of bad news here, but it's only bad news, Father, if we refuse to repent and put our trust in Christ. Uh, if there are any here, Father, who are not trusting in Christ, 
we pray, and I know I'm not the only one here praying for this, but I just pray that your spirit would so move in hearts here today that people would be willing to recognize their sin and to throw themselves on the wonderful mercy that is available in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for these wonderful words, the words of your eternal gospel. And we ask that you make us bold as we go forward and not be afraid to share these words of hope with a dying world that needs to hear them. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you, and I hope you all have a very blessed Sunday. Thank <laughs> you.